I also saw fair Epicaste, mother of King Idipodes, whose awful lot it was to marry her own son without suspecting it. He married her after having killed his father, but the gods proclaimed the whole story to the world, whereon he remained king of Thebes in great grief for the spite the gods had borne him. But Epicaste went to the house of the mighty jailer Hades, having hanged herself for grief, and the avenging spirits haunted him as for an outraged mother, to his ruing bitterly thereafter. Oh, hi there. Hello. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am your host, Liv. You know, I say some variation of that every time I start an episode. And every time I think, this is kind of weird, but like, how else do you just start talking into a microphone and knowing that people are going to listen, but like, you're not talking directly to them? It's just, it's generally weird. Anyway, I've given up on attempting more creative openings. Hi, hello, and or welcome. It's just going to be it forever. Eternity. But enough of, uh, of that. Today I'm here with another Greek tragedy because gods know I love to tell you all about plays. But not only that, I would say that they are just some of the most compelling content that I have in terms of what I haven't already shared with you after so many years. But today's doesn't even really fully count in that respect because, well, I've kind of already talked about this play. Kind of. I did not do it justice. So here we are. I am here today with Sophocles' Oedipus Tyrannos, Oedipus the King, often called Oedipus Rex, even though Rex is Latin, so we're not fucking with that. Oedipus Tyrannos it is. It reminds me to remind you all, though, that technically speaking, the etymological origins of the word Tyrannosaurus Rex do indeed mean King Lizard King. Is the intention Tyrant Lizard King? Sure, but Tyrannos meant king before it meant tyrant. <laughs> but we will get there. First, why I'm covering Oedipus again. I covered this play, this story, in the very early days of the podcast, and while it was fairly detailed, at least compared to some of my other really early episodes, I really didn't do it justice, and specifically the play itself. And there's just, there's so, so, so much to talk about when it comes to this play, the myths surrounding it, the historical context, the Thebes of it all, let alone the Oedipus and Jocasta of it all. And I just really want to dive deeper into that. Uh, and since this is my show and I can do what I want, here we are. Now, I am referring to a whole collection of editions and translations here. It turns out I own like six, but the majority of quotes will be from one by Frank Nisitich um, from the big modern library edition of the Greek plays, which is a, a great edition of a bunch of plays by all three tragedians, FYI. And uh, any particularly lengthy passage I think only just one, um, will be from the public domain translation by Richard Jeb. Everything is listed in the episode's description uh, where possible, like always. So let's talk once again, five years later, about that man so famous for murdering his father and marrying his mother. I mean, spoilers, I guess, but it's pretty well-known and old story. But most importantly, let's talk about how much more there is to the story than just those salacious Freudian ideas. This is episode 210. Just a nice young man from a nice family. Sophocles' Oedipus Tyrannos, Part 1. That quote I read at the top of the episode wasn't actually from Oedipus Tyrannos, as you might have gathered from the names used, but it was all too relevant anyway. Because the oldest reference to the story of Oedipus in Thebes and everyone whose lives were entangled in his tragedy 
is found in Homer's Odyssey. It's when Odysseus is visiting the underworld and he's seeing all of those women there that Persephone shows him. The names are different. Oedipus's mother is named Epicaste there, and his own name is a little more literal, Oedipodes uh, versus Oedipus, both of which just mean, I think it's crooked foot, something like that. The point ultimately is that for all Sophocles' play is the oldest surviving source that gives us any kind of real detail on the story of Oedipus and his family drama, for lack of a better word, we know that it was a very, very ancient story, just like the rest of the epic and often tragic and horrifying Theban dynasty. What we don't know, though, is how many additional bits and pieces were invented by Sophocles or exaggerated or anything of that sort. One of the most fascinating things to remember when we're talking about any Greek play that, you know, features a myth is that it was at its core a play. It was entertainment, fictionalized by a tragedian. It could even be likened to a movie today or a fictional retelling of a myth. Sophocles likely had a certain degree of concern when it came to staying true to his source material, at least to an extent, but ultimately he wanted to impress the crowd, the judges. He, he wanted to create a good tragedy that would move his audience, that would elicit certain emotions and opinions. And because we don't have his source material, we don't really have anything besides that line in Homer, we can only speculate as to what Sophocles invented and what existed in the foundational myth that he was working off of. As always, the most interesting thing about Greek myth and the ancient sources broadly are all the things that we don't know. What we do know, though, are a handful of things about the creation of this play and Sophocles' other two so-called Theban plays. He wrote three plays about this family in Thebes, but it wasn't a trilogy. He wrote Antigone first, which I covered late last year and might be better called The Crayon Show. <laughs> And then years later, he wrote Oedipus Tyrannos and later Oedipus at Colonus, which is events that take place after this play. It's often packaged now as a kind of trilogy, but it wasn't one really. The only surviving trilogy that we have from ancient Greek tragedy is Aeschylus's Oresteia. What that means, even if it ne isn't necessarily what Sophocles intended, is that this play, Oedipus Tyranno, serves as a kind of prequel, since everyone would have already seen Antigone or been aware of it. They would be aware of Oedipus and Jocasta's children in the aftermath of the events that will take place in this play. Gods know I could talk more about context forever, but I will spare you. Sophocles' play opens on the palace of Thebes. A group of Thebans are there, led by a priest. Oedipus, their king, speaks first. Quote, Children, latest in the line of ancient Cadmus, what is the meaning of your sitting here? Yeah, I, I had to quote that just because of Cadmus's name. What of it? Oedipus goes on. He asks what they're doing there. Why are they carrying the, the means of supplication, of, of prayer and worship intended for the god of healing, Apollo? He addresses the priest, who, who's there, quote, why are you here? Is it something you're afraid of? Something you want? I'll do all I can, for I'd be hard of heart if this appeal did not move me to pity. They're there seeking help, the priest tells Oedipus. He tells him about the people of the city, how many of them are there now, seeking guidance. Others are around the city, which is struggling. Quote, for the city, as you yourself see, is now sorely vexed and can no longer lift her head from beneath the angry waves of death. A blight has fallen on the fruitful blossoms of the land, the herds among the pasture, the barren pangs of women, and the flaming god, the malign plague, has swooped upon us and ravages the town. He lays waste to the house of Cadmus, but enriches Hades with groans and tears. It is not because we rank you with the gods that I and these children are suppliants at your hearth, but because we deem you the first among men in life's common fortunes and in dealing with the divinities. When you came to the city of the Cadmians, you freed us from the tax that we rendered to the hard songstress, and that when you knew no more than anyone else, nor had you been taught, but rather by the assistance of a god, as the story goes, you uplifted our life. 
Now, Oedipus King, glorious in our eyes, we, your suppliants, beseech you to find some defense for us, whether you hear it from some divine omen or learn of it from some mortal. What they're saying is there's a plague in the city of Thebes and the people desperately need help from their king. Not only is he their king, that priest said, but he is the king who took the throne after saving the city from another blight, another curse, the Sphinx. He's proven that he can help them. That's why they're there pleading with him now. Please, the priest is basically begging Oedipus, seek help from whoever or wherever you need to find a solution to this horrible plague. Oedipus is sympathetic to his citizens. He knows that they're ill, that the plague is making its way through Thebes, leaving few standing. But, he says, because he's still a man in Greek myth, <laughs> quote, I know you all are sick, yet none as sick as I. The pain you feel comes to each of you alone, apart from others. But my heart groans for city and self and you alike. I mean, is that really necessary, Oedipus? He's trying to make it clear that he understands the gravity of the situation. Maybe I'm just being a bit judgy, but don't make it about you. We'll move on. He tells them that he's been working on it. He hasn't been ignoring the plague. He's been searching. And the only solution that he's found is that he has sent his brother-in-law, Creon, to the Oracle for guidance on how they can save the city. But he adds that Creon has been gone for some time and Oedipus is starting to worry about him. And how lucky, because the priest follows this by pointing out that Creon is approaching now, to which Oedipus announces with relief, quote, Oh, Lord Apollo, may his coming be a stroke of luck, salvation shining like a light. The priest is optimistic. Creon is wreathed in Apollo's laurel, his Daphne, if you will, and that's a good sign. Oedipus calls to Creon, asking him what news he has. Is it good? Creon confirms that it's good, even if just because they're finally having answers. Should he tell the king, though, in, in front of all these people? He asks, indicating the priest and the suppliants who have been speaking with Oedipus. Yes, 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 he's told. Tell me the news in front of everyone. They deserve to hear. So Creon tells him, quote, What I heard from the god was this. Phoebus orders us, my lord, to expel a pollution nurtured in this land of ours and not still nurture it till its past cure. Which frankly is a super confusing sentence even in this very modern translation. Still, the point is this. There is something or someone in the city that's causing the plague and they need to get rid of it now. How do we get rid of it? Oedipus asks. Exile or death, he's told, quote, since it is blood that engulfs the city now. Of course, it's still it isn't clear who or what Creon is referring to, or what Apollo is referring to in his prophecy, so Oedipus gets further clarification in the form of a very necessary history lesson. Creon tells him that they had a leader before him, before Oedipus took control, and he uses the word leader specifically, or equivalent. He doesn't tell Oedipus that they had a king, a Tyrannos. Our leader's name was Laius, he explains. He ruled before you, Oedipus, before you took over. He died. He was murdered. And Apollo is now ordering us to punish his murderers, whoever they may be. And gods, is that unhelpful? Oedipus is frustrated. He presses Creon. Who are they? Where are they? How are we supposed to find out who it was that killed your leader? The oracle confirms that the murderer is there in Thebes. He or they are ready to be found. How did he die? Where did he die? Oedipus asks his brother-in-law. He went to seek guidance from the oracle, Creon replies, and he never came home again. And no one saw what happened? No one was there to report anything about this? Oedipus presses. They're all dead, Creon says. Everyone who was with him except for one who couldn't really say what he saw. Just that bandits killed him. Quote, the strength of many, not just one, brought him down. Oedipus theorizes now that if that was the case, surely they had help. 
even support from others. The implication here is that Laius wasn't liked by his people, that they might have sought his downfall and conspired against him. Cran confirms that they thought that might be the case too at the time, but after his death, no one came forward to claim it or to help the city in its resulting struggle. Why didn't you go looking for his murderers? Oedipus asks now. What was preventing you from looking into it? It was the Sphinx, Creon tells him. Quote, The riddle-chanting Sphinx kept our eyes on things at hand. Those out of sight we left alone. To which Oedipus replies, quote, I'll bring them back to light from the beginning. Oedipus has announced very clearly that he's going to root out whoever it was that killed their former leader, Laius. He agrees that both Creon and the Oracle are right to show concern for the man who'd been killed. Quote, And now you'll see me also take his side, as I should, supporting land and God together. It's not for the sake of a distant friend that I'll dispel this pollution, but for my own. For the man who killed him may well want to turn on me with the same violence. I would uh, watch your words, Oedipus. But he doesn't. He's showing his might. He's proving himself to be a good king, as he believes himself to be. Of course he'll seek out whoever killed Laius. Like, of course that will be his top priority. And not only because it could solve the illness plaguing the city, but because his own life, his own rule, is threatened if someone is out there just killing the leaders of Thebes. With that, he directs the priest and the suppliants to be on their way. He tells them that he's going to handle it. He's going to save them from this curse on their land, this plague. And with that, he leaves, and Creon too, leaving the priest and the suppliants on the stage. The priest has one final word, directing his suppliants with him, confirming that they've heard the oracle's words, Apollo's words, and may he come and save them. Quote, deliver us from plague. It's the chorus that joins the stage now, left alone there. The chorus is a group of Theban elders, men, and they sing of all that's happened. They sing of the oracle, of Zeus. They're afraid. They're not as openly optimistic as the others. They're worried about the oracle's words, worried about a debt that might be owed. They call to the gods, all of them. They call out specifically to Athena and then to Artemis, Apollo too, calling them, quote, Triple averters of doom, if ever before, when ruin towered above our city, you put the flame of pain to flight. Come to us now. They sing of the plague, the pains and sickness of the people of Thebes, that they can't fight it off by force. No sword can help them through what the city is now experiencing. They can't just defeat it like they would a natural enemy. They sing of death, of pain, quote, Here and there, young wives and gray-haired mothers huddle at the altars, groaning, crying to be freed of pain. They speak of Ares, using the god of war as a kind of personification of the plague of Thebes. They want to send him away, to the depths of the sea, to Thrace, where he's from, anywhere but there in the city where he's causing such destruction. They ask Artemis for help. Apollo, either of them, could use their arrows in defense of Thebes. They call to Bacchus, Dionysus, for help, the god that called Thebes home. They call to anyone who might help in their battle against the plague personified by Ares. With all of these pleas finished, Oedipus returns to the stage. He tells the chorus that the solution they seek, an end to the plague, will be theirs, provided they can help him. He doesn't know the details of the event, he explains. He was a stranger then. He didn't live in Thebes when this Laius was killed. He wasn't there to experience any of it. They'll have to help him if he's going to solve the murder, if he's going to rid the city of Thebes from the bandits that killed their former leader. And then he just 
orders anyone who knows what happened to tell him. Anyone who knows who killed Laius, he needs to come forward. He says that if the person who knows this truth is worried about their punishment, well, he, they shouldn't be. He won't be killed for coming forward with the truth, only exiled. He goes on to lay down his law. Anyone who shelters the killer, anyone who speaks to him at all, joins him in prayer, anything, they will be punished. Quote, no, but all must drive him from their houses. He is our pollution, as the oracle of the god of Delphi has just now disclosed to me. Every word that Oedipus speaks here is important. Every second that he lays out a punishment for the killer of Laius, every word of recrimination, every claim of what he'll do to the murderer. It's all deeply relevant. It's all setting the stage. And boy, does Oedipus go hard in his words against this killer and his threats. His words are just, well, they're too much. Quote, but now, since I enjoy the power that was his, and have his bed, and the woman he embraced in it, who would have borne him children, siblings, to my own, had not his hopes of offspring foundered and bad luck swooped upon him, for all these reasons, I will fight for him as for my own father, go to every length in my determination to catch the killer of the son of Labdacus, son of Polydorus, son of Cadmus before, and of ancient Agnor. Oedipus married Laius' widow. He fathered her children. He sleeps in Laius' bed. For all these reasons, Oedipus has told the chorus he's going to avenge his predecessor's death with all that he has. He's going to find the killer of Laius. Whoops. Oedipus might have considered his words a bit more carefully. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Oedipus finishes his speech by wishing the worst upon whoever refuses what he's commanded, anyone who works against him, anyone who helps this murderer, oh, he wishes further plague upon them. The chorus leader tells him in reply, I didn't do it, that much I can be certain of, and I don't know who did it. Only the oracle seems to know that. But he's got an idea all the same. He tells Oedipus that the seer, the prophet Tiresias, is their best bet. He has the gift of sight from Apollo himself, quote, from him, my lord, would a man tracking all this learn of it most clearly. Yes, it's Tiresias who will have the answers that they're looking for. Yes, yes, Oedipus says, I've called for him already. This isn't news to me. He's asked for Tiresias to come twice now, he says, and he still hasn't come. Oedipus knows already that Tiresias is the best for answers, that if anyone will know, it's him. Well, the leader replies, without Tiresias, quote, all we have is ancient gossip. Moments later, though, the ancient gossip falls aside. It wasn't helpful. Anyway, just the same news Oedipus has heard, bandits or the highwaymen, but no one knows or has seen the killer themselves. It's fine, though, because look at that. Finally, Tiresias has arrived. The blind prophet Tiresias joins the stage. He's guided by a young man who holds on to him, showing him where to go. The boy doesn't speak. Oedipus greets him, this famed prophet who is seemingly immortal because he appears in so many of Thebes' most famous myths, regardless of when they would have taken place, regardless of what king would have been alive and what children then he had. It's fine. Oedipus announces, quote, Tiresias, master of all that can or can't be taught or said in heaven or treading on the earth. He goes on to explain to Tiresias what they'd learned from the oracle though he imagines Tiresias already knows it all himself, what with his skill in prophecy, his own gifts from Apollo. He finishes, quote, Save yourself, save the city, and save me. Drive out all taint that comes from the dead man. We are in your hands to help with all you have, and all you can do is the noblest task. Tiresias's reply is just so Tiresias, quote, there's nothing to be said for understanding if you have it and gain nothing. I knew that well and forgot it. Else I wouldn't be here now. Like, what? 
Oedipus questions him. What's wrong? Why do you look so sad when you've only just arrived? Tiresias tells him simply that he should be sent home, that Oedipus should just do his part and Tiresias would, will do his alone. He, he's got to go. Of course, that's not what Oedipus wants to hear. He wants help. He is ordering Tiresias to help, to tell him what he needs to know. Still, Tiresias hesitates. He pushes back, speaking in riddle-like language, just trying to get out of speaking with Oedipus, just telling him what he knows. Oedipus takes this as possible betrayal. Why would Tiresias avoid answering his questions if he wasn't seeking to hurt Thebes itself, if he wasn't seeking to hurt Oedipus? But no, that's not it, Tiresias explains. He's just asking, Oedipus is just asking questions that he doesn't want to know the answers to. Oedipus gets angrier and angrier, and Tiresias points this out, that Oedipus is angry, but he shouldn't be angry with him. The answer is going to come out regardless of whether Tiresias is the one to say it. But Oedipus is really raging now. He can't see anything beyond his own fury. He thinks that all of this means that it was Tiresias who did it. That Tiresias is the murderer all along. And that's the only reason he could be hiding the truth so completely. And that's enough to finally push Tiresias to the limit. He tells Oedipus, quote, Then I insist that you abide by your own proclamation, and from this day speak neither to these men here and nor to me, for you are the unholy polluter of our land. It's you who killed Laius, Oedipus. Now what do you have to say? Now how will you handle all the punishments that you've laid out for the murderers? Oedipus won't accept this, though. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. He presses Tiresias. What are you talking about? Where did you learn that? Something so ridiculous. I've seen it, Tiresias says. With my gift of prophecy. I tried not to say it, he adds, but you made me. They go back and forth like this, a good old stickomythia, back and forth. Lines just said quickly, urgently, as both deny the other's words. Tiresias is clear in what he's saying, though. Quote, you are the killer you are looking for. <laughs> he confirms it again and again. The longer Oedipus pushes back against his claim, it is, he won't relent. There's three lines that I want to read now. They're impactful and important and like a really good indication of this entire back and forth that goes on between Tiresias and Oedipus for so many lines. But the three start with Tiresias, who says, quote, What a sad case you are, taunting me as all these here will soon be taunting you. Wrapped as you are in endless dark, you can't hurt me or anyone who sees the light, Oedipus replies. True, I'm not the one to cause your fall. Apollo who wants to see it, will suffice. Tiresias answers. This leads Oedipus to question even Creon's loyalty. He can't accept that any of this could be true. It has to be a plot against him. A madman. There, there just has to be some reason because certainly, no, he thinks, he, he couldn't have killed Laius. He didn't kill Laius. He couldn't be the cause of Thebes' plague. It's ridiculous. Oedipus is once again further descending into just this abject fury. He can't see anything except the accusations against him, and he simply can't and won't accept them. There has to be some other reason. He knows it. It must be Creon. That's the only explanation. So he turns on Creon, in words at least, suggesting that he wants to overthrow him. That's what's happening. Creon's behind it. That's it. Then he turns to Tiresias. He questions his skill as a prophet, questions his gift now. He insults it. He tells Tiresias that he can't be that good because he couldn't defeat the Sphinx. Couldn't rid the city of Thebes from that blight when she was tormenting them? No, Oedipus says. It was only me who was able to defeat that sphinx. Only I was skilled enough to answer her riddle. Only I could do it. That's how he knows he's in the right, and he's he's the rightful ruler, that all of this is bullshit, and he certainly, definitely, absolutely did not kill the former ruler of Thebes. He, he did not kill Laius. No, he saved the city. It was all him. He is the savior and not the murderer. Of that, Oedipus is certain. No one can question it. He knows it to be true. It's all a plot to get him. He jabs at Tiresias, quote, You think one day you'll stand by Creon's throne. Well, I think that you and he will rue the day you plotted to purify this land. If you didn't look so old, you'd know by now what plans like yours deserve. Oh, they'll rue the day they plotted to purify this land. Such words to use, Oedipus, such certainty in your own innocence, in your right 
to rule Thebes. We'll see how that turns out. Oh, nerds, nerds, nerds. As always, thank you so much for listening. Gods, this play, it starts off with a bang. Oedipus Stratos is often considered like this peak Greek tragedy. It's seen that way today, but it was also considered to be that in the ancient world too. Like made clear by Aristotle in his work, The Poetics, it's about exactly that. Like storytelling and tragedy, and and he deems Oedipus Tyrannos as it, the peak. What's interesting to me though, surprise, surprise, is how different it is from so many Euripides plays. Where Euripides imbues his tragedy with a, a bit of comedy, dark comedy certainly, but but comedy, there's a bit of lightness amongst the dark, Sophocles goes heavy. It's all plague and horror and seeking out murderers. The chorus is pained, tragic, horrified, just sad. Of course, of course there's, there's so much else to come. But that it opens with, with such weight is fascinating to me, particularly when compared to Euripides. That said, for all even Aristotle determined it was the one to be imitated, the perfect form of tragedy, it didn't actually win first in the competition. That went to a play by this nephew of Aeschylus, a man named Philocles, and everything is lost of his. And isn't that interesting in itself? But back to the real world. So I just have to share um, that while it's actually, it's been a number of weeks since this happened by the time you're hearing this episode, but I'm writing the script the day after I got home from Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I was invited to speak at Harvard's classical mythology class. And while that was uh, seriously fucking cool, the idea that the, this thing, the, this thing, this wild thing that I do and that I've built with the help of all of you amazing listeners, no matter how long you've been listening, the idea that this has become the kind of thing that gets me um, flown to Harvard to speak in the most beautiful and like church-like theater I've ever seen in my life is just, I mean, it's a dream come true, obviously. And I think a big part of why I get to do this is, is now, is like how I, I tell the stories now, often in comparison to how I told the stories in the very, very early days of the show. I think there's merit to those, but I'm personally just, I'm so proud of how far I've come. For all that I'm still talking about entertaining you all and like, pointing out the hilarity and absurdity and misogyny in Greek myth, like that is still the priority. But I also always want to make sure that I'm giving you as much detail, as much context, as much like passion as the ancient stories and sources and plays deserve. Which is why I like to do things like this, like revisit stories that I've maybe I've told before, before, but before I learned so much more about the ancient sources and like where to look for so much more information before I started speaking with like incredible scholars and historians and archaeologists who've who've taught me so much about the ancient world like I want to use that new knowledge to give you more particularly when it comes to seriously famous stories and myths like this one I mean this is this is truly like the most famous play from the ancient Greek world hands down I mean, Oedipus is one of the most famous mythological figures. Like, and regardless of how much you pay attention to Greek mythology, like you've heard at least basic basic levels of this story, even if it's just like the drama. And that's what makes it a really important uh, play to get right, to get into this nitty gritty. And I mean, frankly, I just I really want to defend not only Jocasta, a woman who's often seriously mistreated and maligned for her role in the story, but Oedipus too, because like gods, he's actually a really sympathetic character when you really start to think about it and like I didn't give him enough credit in that first that first go around but anyway we're only in part one there's so much more to say clearly but I will leave it here um I'm recording this episode uh, from this one onwards far in advance because I am headed to Greece again like I mentioned and so I wanted to say that that one you can follow along with me on Instagram whenever I remember to post photos and videos and stories and and such but which I will I will try to do but I often forget because you know I'm in Greece but also I just want to say thank you all um, for your role in allowing me to to be do this thing that I do and often and 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 go there and just thank you all for listening and for loving the show for reviewing it and telling your friends for being a patron if you are one like honestly just thank you for literally anything that you do in relation to this podcast because all of it no matter how small it seems helps me continue doing this it helps me continue this being my career and I'm just seriously grateful for literally every second that you put into listening to me and my show it means the entire fucking world to me you are awesome thanks and on that note like let's have another five star review reading shall we Thank you uh, for all your reviews. They make me seriously happy. This one comes from a user called Rudy P-Rex in the States. 
fun and entertaining. Came across this as a recommendation from another iHeart podcast. This is a fantastic podcast because of the way Liv delivers the stories, the comedic ways, and enthusiasm. I've always had a great interest in mythology, and it was the only class in high school that I really paid attention to, so this is awesome. Thank you. I'm jealous that you had a class in high school that covered Greek mythology. That's fun. <laughs> Let's Talk About Myths AV is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians and handles so many podcast-related things, from running the YouTube to creating promotional images and videos to editing and research. Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. The podcast is hosted and monetized by iHeartMedia. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron. We'll get access to bonus episodes and more. Visit patreon.com slash mythsbaby or click the link in this episode's description. Thank you all. Seriously, honestly, thank you. From the bottom of my heart. I am Liv and I love this shit so fucking much. My gods.